grief is inherently rude. There's a certain table manner to suspense, a certain etiquette to terror. And grief is inherently rude. We live in a culture that has an extreme aversion to pain. We don't want to feel actual pain. We'll do anything we can to avoid having to feel pain. Anything we will look for anyone or any ideology, any cult that is promising us paradise. And if we are in pain, if we are dealing with grief and loss, we will immediately forfeit, compromise, sacrifice our own health, our own soul, our own humanity in order to lessen that pain, in order to not have to experience the most visceral form of depression possible. My name is Zachary Conan. Today we're talking about Karin Kusama's The Invitation again. The Invitation is uh, a film about dread, and it's my favorite film ever made. It's moved me. It still has me shook. It's completely blown my mind. And on my first video, I, I did nail a lot of concepts. I was more a death of the author kind of video. But now I've, uh, I've, I've purchased the physical copy here, and I've listened to what Karin Kusama has to say. So not only can I pronounce her name correctly, uh, but I also know more so what her motives were, what her actual motives were. In the first video, I do bring up how it speaks directly to modern anxieties, modern social ineptitudes, modern um, suspicions of... Uh, of social gatherings, of how we want to be private people and not have to deal and interact with others, and how it confirms it in a very um, terrifying and ultra-violent way. All, all of your suspicions, all of your uh, paranoid possible delusions confirms them. And I was right about that. But what it also does, it's much larger. I was, in fact, limiting the scope of the film. It speaks to social anxieties, it speaks to modern anxieties, of course, but what's even more revealing about our, uh, about our modern um, errors, about the modern ethos of the day, than just being afraid of social interactions and not trusting people, friends, um, those we've been intimate with in the past. What's even more true and more revealing than just simply that is the, are the reasons behind it. And maybe the reasons behind we're so social, reasons behind the fact that we're so socially inept are because of things like pain. The invitation deals with people who are going through pain. And it's really well done. Um, the main character is Will, and there's another character called Eden, and uh, they, they lost their child. They went through a huge amount of grief, and they are both dealing with it in completely different ways. And uh, while Eden is doing everything she can not to feel that pain, to not be in that incredibly tragic moment uh, to the point of, you know, joining a sort of cult, and the cult is a metaphor, it could be drug addiction, it could be a political ideology, it could be anything, really, anything that, uh, that tacitly, that implicitly, explicitly removes you from the pain without you having to deal with it, Will is constantly in that mode of pain, he is constantly composing himself, he is living in pain, he's living in the past and the present simultaneously, and that's reflected by the general composition of Kusama's film, um, sometimes you don't exactly know when a flashback is happening or not. And Will is certainly a character who lives both in the past and present and being at his old house is certainly um, bringing that, that paradox r right into the, um, the foray, right into the foreground. And also, it's a, Will is not dealing with his grief in a healthy way either. Through the course of the invitation, he has to learn that he wants to live that he absolutely wants to live. He doesn't want to be put out of his misery. And the fact that he is in so much grief, you could argue, um, like I said at the very beginning of this video, grief is inherently rude. But grief is also the only forgivably rude thing you can do. So he is so openly and outwardly uh, possessed by inner demons in this film that everyone else at the dinner party 
uh, completely corral around him and try to help him and try to make him feel good. That you can argue that um, that that Will's own inner demons uh, kind of preoccupied the other guests at the party, and if and if that hadn't happened, the other guests at the party may have been able to pick up on certain things that did not feel right about it. They may have been able to figure out that oh, this this, this absolutely does not feel correct. This absolutely feels eerie and damaged and possibly dangerous. Like uh, like one of the characters at the party did the one who left early or maybe was killed early. You don't know. Absolutely, you don't know. Um, because grief is something that consumes all. And it's not about misery loves company. Misery loves isolating you. Misery loves to make you feel like you're completely alone. And that's the way Will feels. He can't even express himself to Kira, his girlfriend. But near the end of the film, um, he figures out that he wants to live. That he absolutely wants to live. And Eden um, actually has an arc of herself. Uh, there's no true villain in this film. She finally looks inward at herself and at her own grief and realizes that you're always going to be living in that moment. You're always going to be living in the past and the present simultaneously. And this film also benefits from the fact that it was mostly shot chronologically. And I think that really helps the performances. Um, I mentioned in the other video that I love Logan Marshall Green's performance. I thought um, it's one of the best performances I've seen in the last 35 years. And I'm certain that uh, his craft benefited from the fact that it was shot mostly in, in chronological order. We live in a culture that is absolutely obsessed with pain and has this clinical aversion to it at the same exact time. We will, we will do anything not to feel pain. We will do anything not to feel the, the, the negative aspects of being a human being, the negative components of it. And I'm talking about true pain. I'm talking about absolute pain that will never go away, like the death of a child. Something incredibly hyper-intense like that something that, that, that makes you seek escapism. Because we also live in a world, in, in a climate, in an ethos and society that nearly prides itself on how many different modes of escapism we have. If you don't want to feel involved with your own life, we have a multitude of ways to escape it, to run away from it. And we're very proud of that. And we revel in it. The Invitation is a film that says... You need to compose yourself. You need, you need to face your pain. You need to live within that pain. But that pain should lead you to a place where you choose to live, where you choose to survive. <clears throat> but you can't be like Will, and you can't be like Eden. They both have to learn lessons in this film. It's such a remarkable film, and it's my favorite film of all time, because in that first video, I am manic. I am possessed by, by my love for Karin and Kusama's work. I am I'm just completely on cloud nine, as I put it. And in this one, I'm much more somber in, in, a, in, in the juxtaposition of the two. Because the true meaning of the film has finally seeped into me, has finally knocked me on my head. I relate to Will so much, Logan Marshall Green's character, I relate to him so much. I'm, I'm constantly living within the past and present simultaneously. And the, the inescapable grief that is intrinsic in living in that kind of a dynamic dichotomy is inescapable, is preventing me from making connections with people, preventing me from taking a responsibility of my own life as well. Like, this is a film that speaks to not only the modern anxiety, is the modern ethos of of our time and place, and it's very emblematic of that. It also speaks directly to me, <laughs> and something that I'm dealing with at, at 29 years old. Um, it, it might be intrinsically involved with the era that I'm living in, but I would argue against that. I would argue that it's just speaking to me genuinely and authentically. It's telling me that I don't need to take the invitation that I'm constantly being invited by all of these promises for paradise, by all of these promises for salvation. And I don't need to take them. You shouldn't take them. There's only one invitation you should take, and that's to life itself. And you should continue to live and live openly and healthy um, if, you're in a, if you're in a relationship with, with, with anyone. Be open with them. And this is a film that learns 
that, that, that learns a lot of tricks of form, um, tricks of composition from people like Polanski, from people like Alfred Hitchcock, from films like High and Low, so Kuros Kurosawa even. There's also shades of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. There are shades of uh, The Tenant and the Vanishing. There are shades of uh, Richard Linklater's tape. But those all come together to form a plea, to form Karen Kusama's absolute, grand, isolated, simple, and incredibly sophisticated masterwork of suspense, The Invitation. This is my favorite film ever made because it's teaching me one of the most valuable lessons I've ever been taught by film. Um, one of the most valuable lessons I've ever been taught. Don't run away from grief. Don't escape from grief. Don't accept every invitation to do so. Because that is so human. That is so remarkably flawed. It is so of our own modern ethos and age and era. And it, it's adding to the modern anxiety. It's adding to being unhealthy. It's adding to the modern chill. I absolutely love this film. This, this film is everything. And it's just so wonderfully composed. Um, very simple. There's not a whole lot of trickery to it. It's an incredibly authentic movie. And I feel like Karen Kusama is an extremely open filmmaker and that this is her magnum opus and I feel that it's very important to her. And transcendentally it's very important to me as well. This is not a film that is a static being. This is not a film that you can boil down to a, uh, a logical um, suspense a logical uh, film film theory. You cannot boil it down to that. Boil it down to something extremely cold and academic. This film is not static being. This film is by dynamic becoming. This film is is a film that moves. It's a film that, that, that operates in a very visceral way. In a way that is emotionally tactile. In a way that you will always feel. That you will always understand. And, and in a way that will always resonate. The Invitation is a film that will always define the 2010s always define this modern anxiety. I just hope that we can get past it. We, we live in a place that, in a world that refuses to feel actual pain. That's told poetically in this film. It's told compositionally, emotionally, conceptually. It's told remarkably. It's told cinematically. It's told in a way that hits me and continues to. This might be one of the most important films I've ever seen because the message is so extremely important to tell me and I feel so in line with Will. I feel so in line with this main character that it's positively frightening. That's what makes it such a brilliant horror film because I am that person. I am in that mode of constant, of constant composition of self. Because I'm always blindsided by something. I'm always struck by by the lightning of loss. By I'm all my 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 world is always rumbling from the thunder of grief and the the absolute vibrations of pain. I need to be open. <laughs> I need to be open with people. I compartmentalize a lot of things. I don't tell people a whole lot of things. I keep a lot of things to myself and compartmentalize my emotionality. Like, I shouldn't tell you this because this has absolutely nothing to do with you. It will completely bleed out. But sometimes you need to be open with people, especially people who you are romantically involved with, like Will and Kira. Will is refusing to give himself completely to Kira because Kira represents the future. And also, in several aspects, the present. But Will is a person who lives in all three of those dimensions simultaneously. In fact, he only lives in the past and uh, the present. He doesn't live in the future until the end. He doesn't even think about the future because he doesn't believe that he deserves one. He believes that in the present and the past, and those are the only, that, that's his duality. That is what he um, experiences the world in. That's his phenomenological reasoning right there. And I need to be someone who can live in all three, past, present, and future, in a healthy way. Because if you only live in the past and in the present, then your, your present is always being 
overrun and ruled by your past, by your demons. You need to figure out a way to deal with grief. Luckily, I've never gone down the road that Eden has. I have not accepted an invitation. I mean, <clears throat> in the past, sure, I've like, I've done certain things that, that, that may have been um, incorrect or, um, you know, may have been in, in error, but um, I refuse to accept invitations of, 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 of false promises. I don't do that anymore. But now I need to believe that I, that I have earned this life. You know, and I can make it happen existentially or just authentically, just actually. The Invitation is a brilliant film. It has a lot to do with the etiquette of grief, with the etiquette of depression, and with the etiquette of sadness. A horror film of bad manners. And you know what? It's changed my life. It's completely altered my view of the world. It's added a whole new lens for me to look through. Not just with film criticism, but with the unbearable weight of mere being. I wanna thank you guys for watching this video. I really like doing extremely emotional videos about film. Because I want to provide you with something that you can't get anywhere else. And what you can't get anywhere else is, is my true self, my true authenticity, my true response to films. And I believe that's what the invitation gives you as well. Because what something like Knife in the Water, Rope, uh, Tape, more high and low, more isolated films that are very tense, full of tension, full of suspense and the macabre, what those can't give you is something as hyper-emotive, something as emblematic of modern anxieties as The Invitation. The Invitation transcends all of that because it's trying to teach you very valuable lessons. It's not trying to torment you, it's trying to provide an antidote to the tormented. That's why it's my favorite film ever made, because I think the antidote works. Karin Kusama. To Karin Kusama, everybody. If you got a smoke, light them. If you got them, kick back and to Karin Kusama. Let's, let's just think about it. Let's just think about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karin Kusama. Thank you. Thank you for watching the video. Please subscribe to the channel. Uh, my name is Zachary Conan. And also, if, if it's not too much to ask, please like the video. The YouTube algorithm really appreciates audience interaction. But what I would like even more than a like, I mean, definitely like the video, but what would matter even more to me are your thoughts in the comments. What do you think about grief? What are other films from the 2010s that deal with grief in a very interesting way? I might put Enemy by Denis Villeneuve on this list as, uh, on, on the list of films that deal with grief and paranoia extremely well. Of course, that's much more Kafka-esque. In fact, that owes everything to Kafka. I don't think it's properly emblematic of our time and place because I think that um, Enemy is far too loyal to, to, to Kafka. I mean, uh, Enemy you could put in any time period. That's why the invitation is so special and a lot better than Enemy. Not that I don't know why I decided to <laughs> instill this video with, with, with that comparison at the end, but I think Enemy deals with grief in a very good way. But what are some other films from the 2010s that deal with grief? in very sophisticated ways, ways that are emblematic of our own modern anxieties, films that could only be made in the 2010s. What are other films from this time period that deal with grief in a very remarkable way, like Hereditary possibly as well? There's a lot of films. That's why you know it's of the modern anxiety, because because uh, so many films deal immediately with grief, especially especially within a family structure or, or, a, or a marital um, um, relationship. So many films deal with grief and how people respond to it in very unhealthy ways. We possibly never dealt with pain and grief in a more unhealthy way than right now. I'm really curious about that. What are some other films that deal with grief but try to teach you a valuable lesson about how to properly deal with it? Leave, leave it in the comments. That would mean a lot more to me than just a like. I want to hear your responses. I want this to be an actual community. And it is so far. It is shaping up to be one. And uh, I couldn't be more proud of that fact.
Thank you so much for watching this video. My name is Zachary Conan. Subscribe, like, comment, and um, of course, uh, share this video if it's, um, if it's fitting anywhere. Uh, do want to get some exposure. Thank you so much for watching this video. Have a remarkable day.